Wake up with the news and information you can trust. Starting your day the right way with the Andy Griffin Show. This is News Radio 890 92.5 KDXU. It's not very often I have a villain on the show, but today I have a villain on the show. His name is Zach Renstrom. Now, Zach, there are people out there who, you know, I don't like the water guy, and he makes too much money, and he decides everything about growth, and you get, you hear it all, right? Yeah, and yeah. You, you hear it all. But not very often does someone call you a villain, especially in print, in print. with a picture of you that they set up. <laughs> In a national magazine. In a national ma- Time magazine. Uh, if you want to see a picture of Zach, go to uh, Time dot com, and uh, there's a ma- there's a there's a story about water, uh, and about I don't know halfway down, if you scroll down through this story, there's a picture of Zach standing in what about uh, thigh high water in front of a tree, and the caption says, and I'm going to read it direct here, uh, uh, Zach, Water District General Manager Zach Renstrom in Sand Hollow Reservoir. Cast as a villain in the water crisis. Yeah, Renstrom, uh, Renstrom pivoted toward an ambitious conservation plan. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> They're like contradicting themselves. You, you want an ambitious conservation plan. That sounds like a good thing, not a bad thing. Well, if you, you have to kind of read the whole article to see okay. the whole tone of it, um, where it's kind of coming from. And so uh, St. George slash Washington County gets portrayed very negatively in national press in regards to how we use our water. Okay, and so this article is is kind of talking about that. Mm. So, and you're the main antagonist. Apparently, I'm the poster child <laughs> for for that, and so that's that's why they called me out as a villain. And and even th- when time came and did their articles, they they went around talking to people, local citizens, and um, some of the citizens. It's, you know, it's one of those things uh, people don't necessarily like doing certain things but it's kind of like well it's necessary type thing nobody wants to take medicine but it's kind of one of those things sometimes it's necessary you don't want to die then you will take it yeah and so they they you know they, they went around talked to some people and and uh uh yeah so i got cast as a villain is this uh, is, uh, the story i guess approaches it for talking about the navajo nation is that kind of why you're the bad guy because they don't they're not getting what they want not so much that. Okay. I mean, so what What the main gist of the article is that here in Washington County, uh, our water is, uh, we, we've developed our water sources. Our, our water actually is very, very cheap here in Washington County. We have some of the cheapest water rates in the, in the country, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and our water use, you know, we, like, we have water. But over on the Navajo tribe or the reservation, you know, they, they do have a, a water issues going on over there. And so a lot of their homes don't have running water or they, they have to truck water from long ways away. Um, the article doesn't necessarily get into the details of why or what's happening there. It just says basically here in Washington County, they have golf courses and swimming pools and everybody has running water and mm-hmm. um, yada, yada, yada. We're over on the tribal land. A vast majority of their population is has to like truck water to their homes and to their cattle and then all these other things and so it doesn't get into the why and all that stuff it just tries to do the to comparison well how, how does that make you the bad guy though Be- <laughs> you're the bad guy because we have water well where we become the where i kind of get portrayed as the bad guy is number one that our it's kind of interesting because our water rates are so low the article disagrees with our law of water rights which i'm actually quite proud of yeah um Me, I, i'm glad too <laughs> yeah uh, so we have lower water rates. And then the other thing is, it's like, well, look, they're just, that, that's, in Washington County, they're just wasting water. And, and they're just abusing water. And they're not treating it with its respect or utilizing it as a special resource. And the, artic- the article kind of implies that I should use a big hammer and go around and do more to that. And I, mm-hmm. I just, first of all, legally, I couldn't do that. And second of all, I just don't think that's my role. So, okay. yeah, so yeah. it gets into all those details. It, it'll be interesting to see how this article is received because in parts of the country, many parts of the country, water is absolutely not an issue. It's, mm-hmm. it's actually the opposite. They actually have too much water a lot of places. You look at, you know, some, a place like New Orleans or, mm-hmm. or, you know, any town on the Mississippi, Memphis or whatever, right, right there on the Mississippi. There's water everywhere. They have plenty of water. I went to Europe. I was on, you know, did a cruise on the Rhine River. Water every. I mean, the Rhine River is ginormous. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard to. They use the word river there, and then we use the 
or, you know, the Santa Clara or the Virgin River here. And like, uh, that's not a river. That was a river over there yeah. in Europe. So uh, I think a lot of people will go, huh, what, 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 are you, what are you talking about? But it's a reality here. So in, in, in talking and seeing what's going on, uh, cause I mean, Time Magazine is mostly picked up on the, the East and West coast yeah so the big thing is is that the the native americans slash the the tribal land or reservations um it kind of reflects how life on those are very tough and that something should be done about it is kind of how it's being perceived and so it's not so much hey washington county's bad zach's a villain it's more of like hey on these reservation lands it's a it's tough and so in reading the comments and, and just hearing the, the other things about it, that's kind of how it's being picked up or perceived. It's not so much sack the villain. It's more, hey, these reservations, what's going on there? And there's, there, there, people could, like, people could go into very deep, deep, like, huge thesis of hmm. what was going on there and what's happened. So, do you, do you like being cast as a bad guy? Is that, so, so, well, what do your kids think? You know, it, oh, my kid. My kids laughed. Um, <laughs> I, I, because of the role that I took on, um, I, I, I get called out a lot. I mean, it, hey, we, there's that old saying: you, you drink whiskey, you fight over water, and it's, it's mm-hmm. very true, and it's still going on. It's been going on for hundreds of years, and that stuff. And so, my, my, the position I'm in, people have very, very strong feelings about what should be done and what mm-hmm. shouldn't on, on the on the full spectrum. And I'm supposed to try to do the best to navigate that and make sure we're, we're using the best science, the best knowledge to make sure that uh, we just treat this very limited resource with the respect and uh, that we just need to be good stewards. And so that's what I try to do. And so when I get criticized on, on the spectrum on both side, every side, I just have to kind of go back and say, I at the end of the day, when I go home, I've, I've I did my very, very best. I've tried my very, very hardest to make sure that uh, I'm doing right for the community. I didn't. Well, well, I'll change topic a little bit. We'll, we'll take you away from the villain okay. uh, and, and talk about my personal experience. I just did. Uh, we used a, a landscaper here in town, and uh, we got rid of our front yard grass, and yep. we put in some artificial turf. We planted some uh, some uh, rose bushes and, and different uh, bushes in the area, and some a little bit of river rock. They call it. It's the, kind of the bigger rocks mm-hmm. instead of the little rocks, and. Uh, received first of all the reviews from all the neighbors like wow this is amazing mm-hmm. you know and uh, but second of all we are going to get the complete the process to get the uh, rebate Good. for swapping our grass out and uh, I'm happy to report I, I'm I'm on, I'm on board Zach hey w- <laughs> when we, we you know everybody has to understand this is a voluntary program right nobody nobody twisted my arm except my wife <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so we, when we go back and we talk to people, people are very, very happy. They're very pleased, both from just the process. Like we reach out and say, hey, w- was that a good process? Did my employees work well with you? Are they kind? Did they? And then we get really positive reviews on that. And then we just say, are you glad you did it? Yeah. And the same thing, people are like, oh, yeah, it's easier to maintain. It actually saves us money in the long run. And so on both sides it seems been like it's been a very very positive program and and so we'll definitely continue and push forward with it so artificial turf has been around a long time i remember going as a little kid to houston astros games on the old astro turf and that was essentially green carpet yeah on concrete yeah. it was not good yeah. uh, but it has come a long way and and they even have now the kind of turf we got so a, a lot of the turf gets bad reviews for getting hot when the sun is shining mm-hmm. on them they actually have if you depending on what i don't weight or what i don't know all the details but uh, turf that does not get very hot Mm -hmm. we were able to buy some because that was one of our concerns because that's the west side of our house Mm -hmm. and the sun all afternoon would be beating down on that we were worried it was going to reflect a lot of heat and we were able to get some turf that actually does really well Mm -hmm. with heat so um yeah it's come a long way and and i i I, now again it's only been it happened two days ago so (laughs) it's only been two days but uh, we're pretty excited about it and it looks great so i have artificial turf in my backyard and my kids um they actually really like it. They're out there um, kicking the soccer ball quite a bit back and forth. And, and yeah, and my kids, well, my son's happy because he doesn't have to mow anything. And yeah, so yeah, they've come a long ways. And, and you like, if you just go and say, well, this is artificial turf, they have so many different versions of it. And yeah. it, it's actually pretty cool. Some of the things that they're developing and working on it. And so I think it's just going to slowly continue to improve. 
We, I think we had some grub problem too, problems too with our, our 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 real grass, and so it was kind of right toward the end. We we're like, you know what? We're glad this grass is gone because yeah. we are having some problems, and uh, now we have this beautiful green front okay. yard. No, you showed me the pictures. It really is beautiful. And once those bushes kind of fill out just a little bit, it'll be really, really beautiful. Now, in our old house, my wife uh, had, I think it was like 18, I don't know how many, a lot of rose bushes. She loves roses to the point where, and she's figured out how to make them flourish, and to the point where uh, she was known as the Rose Lady in our old neighborhood. And she wants wants that title back. So that we have now, I, I think it's like, eight or ten rose bushes oh, in good. our front yard area so uh, they'll be blooming at some point but yeah. uh, I just know that uh, you don't want to stick your hand in one of the rose <laughs> bushes because they do have thorns Yeah, they haven't genetically modified the thorns out of rose bushes yet which is good and right now they have the uh, parade of gardens going on where pe- right, right. people can go and, and it's been really well received where people can go um, it, what it is is we have people in the community that have zero scaped their landscaping and uh, they've agreed to allow the public to kind of come and view what's going on there. And it has just been, people go and they're just overwhelmed at how beautiful these gardens are. And um, these these are very well manicured. They, they they take quite a bit of pride in what they've done. And But it's it was a very positive thing rolling out. And uh, so it's, it's just neat to see people be more creative instead of just doing standard grass. Yeah. I uh, wrote an article a couple of days ago called Xeriscape, Z-E-R, no, X-E-R-I, Scape, not zero z e r o <laughs> scape, and and talked a lot about your your Red Hills Garden uh, mm-hmm. Desert Garden up on the hill, and the fact that you don't have to. Uh, well, I remember in the nineties, even we were, you know, a lot of people were like, "Well, I'm going to zero scape my yard," and and honestly, back then it was mostly, you know, rocks, mm-hmm. and you know, maybe to change things up, they'd put a big boulder in the middle, mm-hmm. and you might have a couple of cactuses, and it doesn't have to be just that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know you've talked about the de- the Red Hills Garden, the Desert Garden up there a lot, but uh, maybe just talk to people a little bit about some of the options they can do besides just rocks. In fact, we don't want just rocks. So that is, that is actually one of the things that we really try to emphasize is that if you are ripping out grass, you need to put other vegetation back in there um, because there is a heat index that can occur. And mm-hmm. so we want to make sure, especially trees. And so if you go up to the garden, you can go to like native plants. We have a section, we have cactuses, we have trees, we have a gava center. And so you can kind of go through and all those plants um, flourish in our environment here. And so uh, we have a section that's all of like flowering that goes on too. And so I encourage people to go there and look at it. Um, this parade of gardens, uh, People can go and see all the neat things that people are doing. And, um, yeah, they, like to me, there's a lot more options with a zero scape landscaping than just grass. Like grass is just, you know, it's just one flat out thing out there. But with these other ones, you can do some really amazing things. And so I will say also kind of a plug for our garden is uh, we do the, that Halloween yeah. walk. And that is extremely popular People, where uh, companies or entities will set up like a little scarecrow type looking thing and you Hmm. can kind of walk around there and that's really popular and fun for people to do and people go up there and they see wow this is amazing and then they it's really easy they if they see a plant they like they can actually scan this little code that brings up the website sure yeah and and show them how to plant it and take care of it and so it's just been really positive and it's starting to catch on a lot more and uh, you know christmas isn't that far away you guys do do it up really nice christmas Mm -hmm. time too with the christmas lights and everything i have not been there for the halloween display i have been up there a couple of different times for the christmas one but very cool yeah it's and it's neat that the uh, just these companies and entities participate and and, uh you know they go up and decorate these things and we have a little awards that we hand out and it's it's just very positive and it's fun to go over there to see how many families are up there enjoying it and yeah yeah who's we should shout out. Who, who's the director of that thing? Who, who takes care of that? Ryan White. So Ryan, way to go, Ryan. Yeah. Way to go. He's yeah. he's phenomenal. Then he, you know, we have some. Uh, he has a lot of helpers, um, but Ryan's over that, and uh, Doug Bennett also is involved in that. And he he's a landscape architect. He, he takes great pride in his work, and he, I don't know. He just comes up with some really neat ideas, and so I, I'm fortunate to work with him. Only thing I don't like about the desert gardens is if you have to turn left coming out of there on Red Hills Parkway, scary man. <laughs> so, so I agree. Yeah, and we have gone to the city of St. George, and we says we will even help pay for a, 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 a light. light there. Um, but the 
and I understand this from the engineers, they're saying, well, it doesn't quite warrant a light there. They have their numbers and statistics. Yeah. And yeah they'll and there's a book that they go through, and it's very specific of when lights are required or not. But they're getting so much... Tr- the volume up there is so high, it would be nice to have a light there. So I'm I'm pushing for it, but... And I would advocate anybody that is, is there and needs to go, would be east, I guess, or, or northeast, yeah. turn right, go down and turn around, because turning left across yeah. across Red Hills Parkway is, is a scary prospect. You know, when you have Mayor Randall on the radio, you can make a <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. Uh, we're talking with Zach Renstrom today. We're talking about water. The, he's a villain, apparently, according to Time, Time Magazine. Yeah. Uh, in the fight for water, there's an article. If you didn't, if you're just tuning in, there's an article in Time Magazine. You go to time.com if you want to look at it. And there's a, a picture of Zach, and in, in the caption, t- talks about he's a villain. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, to it's kind of weird because you're the the article is about water and the Navajo, the reservation and the Navajo Nation, and then it compares Washington County and how we have lots of water and making then you the lead bad guy because mm-hmm. we have water, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me it's not your fault the navajo nation doesn't have water so but. yeah and the article doesn't blame me for that or they don't blame us for the problem not directly there. but they they yeah. infer imply whatever yeah. you know so yeah it was an interesting when when these news organizations come out and do these articles and it happens quite often and i really do try to always make myself available to be interviewed by press um you just never know what's going to come out at the very end. And so the, the gentleman that did this article and took the pictures, he, I mean, really nice guy. Um, yeah. I actually took him boating. Did you? Yeah. He, he was, he'd never, he's like, hey, and I kind of mentioned I was going to boating with my family the next day. And he's like, really? And I was like, well, come with us. And came and took a bunch of pictures. But so you just never know the tone of these articles until they actually come out. Yeah. And so. Well, I, you know, I, I've been a writer for many years, lo- wrote a lot of our, uh, articles about people and about things. And uh, you don't, th- I mean, that's one of the things is you're a writer. You don't, you don't tell the person what you're exactly mm-hmm. you're saying. You, I've always been of the opinion that you try to spin everything positive and, and mm-hmm. you don't, uh, especially if someone is c- kind enough to you to take a photo illustration <laughs> of you standing in water and <laughs> if they, if they take you boating and stuff you're not gonna I, you know you don't you're not gonna burn them yeah. by writing something that's not kind but well that's that's one thing i got to do he, he doesn't come out and say i've done anybody wrong like he doesn't say washington county did this or what you know it, it's not it's not blaming anyone per se for what's gone out there it, it's more the contrast but yeah yeah it's it's, it's part of the job we we had a conversation last month when you were on about quality of life and you know the i know one caller called in and said you know every time you tell me that uh i sh- you know i should limit my watering mm-hmm. or we should we should flip you know flip blitz our grass or we should uh you know maybe not not be so uh, water wasteful that that diminishes my quality of life and mm-hmm. and i you know i i was thinking about that a lot here in the last month since, since you were on and i'm like well that, that to me that's that's very uh, what's the word is very narrow minded to say something like that because you know it, that that's like saying uh, but I mean that's like saying you know you you limit my ability to murder someone else so that's <laughs> limiting my quality of life because I wanted to kill that guy I mean there are certain things that may, need to happen for, that's quality of life for everyone yeah. Right. And, and so for me, I was like, I, you know, I, I think about that and I think, well, no, because I can't, for instance, you know, I can't go out on the bluff street right now, stand in the middle of the road, jump up and down and run in front of cars. Yeah. It will diminish someone's quality of life by them having to miss me or maybe hit me. And it will certainly diminish my quality of life. That's against the law. That's not something you do. So, you know, I, I, I it was a month late defending you on that, <laughs> but, but I was thinking about that, Zach. I don't know if you have any thoughts. No, it, it, it's tough because I know a lot of times, and you kind of brought it up at the very beginning of the show about growth. And, and what's happening with growth and with growth there's pros and cons and so a lot of times some people focus on the pros some people focus on the cons and so they come to me and say well you should do this or you should do that right. and I, I kind of respond back it's like that is that's something I fundamentally disagree with you need to go to your elected leaders and have them make these hard to, choices like they need to be, come out and so I've reached out to all the elected leaders of all the, the major cities in Washington County and said, what do you want to do? 
And they all came back and said, we want to make sure that we can continue to grow. And I says, okay, if, I mean, that, I will do that. And so that's why we have had to come out with a lot of these programs. If the city came and said, we're not issuing any more building permits. And I says, okay, you're the elected leaders. You were chosen to make that decision. I would mm-hmm. respond to that. And so our cities have come out and said, we want to grow. We want to continue to grow. And so I'm doing everything I can to make that happen. And so, yeah, I, so to make that happen, there's pros and cons. And, and those people that come out and start talking about that, I'm like, well, don't talk to me about that. Yeah. You know, contact your elected leaders. Um, well, and in talking with the many elected leaders I've had on this show, every one of them is like, look, this is United States of America. Yeah. And we believe in freedom. And if somebody buys some land and wants to build on that land, uh, unless it's against a zoning requirement or whatever, they're, there's really not a lot we can do. Yeah. And, and you know, they, they could change zones and they could, you know, make new laws or, or policies or whatever. But the bottom line is uh, they've all been, every one of them has been pretty adamant that, look, it's their land. They bought it yep. and they're allowed to develop it if they want to. Yeah. And so. that's, and we only have with what, of all the utilities, like we bring in more electricity, we can bring in more food, we can bring in more gasoline. But with water, we only have a certain amount of water here. And so we just have to work within that that amount of water we have and make sure that we're good stewards. What's interesting is the same discussion that we're having, if you go back 100 years <laughs> or 120 years, yeah. they were having the same discussion. Like in St. George, they were talking about people wasting water. They talked about, should we do new water projects to allow more growth here? I mean, there were some people back then that were saying, hey, we don't want any more people here. And there were some people saying, no, we need to really develop this and get this thing moving. And so... It's just the same conversation. We just need to make sure what we do today isn't going to hurt our children in the future. And and one of the things I think is really cool is uh, you're you're making efforts to when we do get water, and it's not necessarily that common, but when we do get a big storm, water comes. We need to hang on to as much of mm-hmm. it as we can because if it just washes downstream, it doesn't come back. It's gone forever. Yeah. So and that's important. That's why we have uh, well Sand Hollow, and that's mm-hmm. why you're working on. Uh, other reservoirs. I think was it, uh, the total six planned right now uh, in the future. Like that we'd hope to build six. Yes, yeah. in the future. So. Some are actively under construction, and some are in the someday category. Wake up with the news and information you can trust. This is the Andy Griffin Show on News Radio 890, 92.5 KDXU, Southern Utah's News Talk Leader. Welcome back. I'm Andy, 935 on KDX. Zach Renstrom is with me from the Washington County Water Conservancy District. He's the general manager, but I like to call him the water czar. <laughs> or a villain if you read Time Magazine. Uh, let's get some nuts and bolts stuff. Uh, watering right now, this time of year, we have this weird hot week, maybe two weeks uh, out of nowhere. It feels like, I mean, we should be, you know, in the 50s at night and in the 80s during the day, but... It's going to be 99 today, Zach. What should we do with our, our watering cycles? Yeah, because of the heat, uh, you, you, those plants still need it. Even though they're supposed to be going dormant right now in those yeah. process, because of the heat, they probably need a little bit of extra water. Uh, but I, this is an area that you can save more water than and any other time just very easily. And that is once those cold weathers do hit, hurry and pull back those irrigation clocks. Um because that's what we see is people will just leave them on. And then in yeah. November, even sometimes December, they'll finally pull it back. And so, yeah, for this this little heat, yeah, give them a little bit of water. But once that temperature drops off, hurry and pull those temperatures back because the plants just don't need it. They're going dormant. And so it's wasted. So, All right. Yeah. little little fault summer, uh, something yeah. going on here for the next week or two. And uh, hopefully it'll cool down. I, I do, you know, I do football games on Friday uh-huh. nights, Zach. <laughs> I was looking at the forecast for Friday for 5 or 5.30 Friday night when I'm setting up my equipment. It's supposed to be 102. It's not crazy. <laughs> I'm like, no, not, it's, it's late September. It can't do that to and us. I got to look up when, when, what's the record on the last day when it's over 100 degrees. And I, I haven't done the research. We're probably asked, getting but, close. Yeah. But I think, yeah, this, this is an unusual one to get 100 this late. So I'm glad we are water prepared, though. Yeah, I mean, this this summer was tough. I mean, it was so hot for so long. Yeah. We didn't quite beat the record of uh, consecutive days over 100 degrees, but we got really close. Uh, very little monsoons, 
but overall, um, like Sand Hall Reservoir is 80% full. And so it, it's good to know that uh, the, all the conservation we're talking about, it, we're seeing that the effects of that and our reservoirs are a good place. And so even if we had like a really miserable winter, like they did like in 2002, mm-hmm. where we just literally got no runoff, uh, I can say, yes, we will definitely have water for next summer because of what we have stored in our reservoirs right now. Well, what would be the number for San Hollow uh, it, if going into winter, so this time of year, mm-hmm. uh, that would be worrisome? Would it be at 50% or lower than that? Anything under 50% would make us very nervous mm. uh, because we just don't know what the winter is going to do. And that's the tough thing. And so when we go back and, and look at other winters about how low the runoff was, like I said, that year, 2002, was a really, really low year across the whole western United States. We're essentially, we, we got no or very, very little water. Well, I want to make sure we have water stored for at least two years. And so if it was at, you know, 50 or 40 percent and I'm looking at no runoff, I, that would say, okay, we'd probably have water for that summer. But then the very next year, we're, we're, yeah. We're, yeah. <laughs> so it's good. 80 percent sand hollow quails. Um, we do it a little bit unique, but it's still doing really well. Gunlock's dropped off a lot this year, um, but it's still okay. And so... It's good to see all that. Where are we at on on Chief Toker Reservoir? (laughs) Is it getting there? Yes. So the foundation's done. We we did all that work. Um, We're in the process of putting out the bid for the actual foundation portion of it. That that that'll be the part that you know sticks above the ground. Mm -hmm. And so they are just finishing those documents. Uh, We have five qualified bidders because we just can't open it up. We have to make sure whoever bids on it is qualified. And so we'll send it to those five bidders and, and they'll come back. And so we should be moving dirt out there again, definitely by the, by the end of the year, you'll see massive trucks out there moving again. There's a, that, that old uh, funny meme that says, uh, remember the, dri- the bridge you're driving on right now was uh, put out to the lowest bidder. <laughs> how, how do you feel yeah. about that bridge now? And, uh, but, but I mean, in all seriousness, they, they have to be qualified for it. It's not just yeah. the lowest bidder and you have Joe Schmo going out there. I can build that. And, you know, it, you actually have to certify people. Yeah. So we have qualified bidders. And then even with the qualified bidders, we go in and we say, well, we have inspectors there all the time. Um, so the, the engineers themselves will go out there quite often and inspect things and make sure that's going on. And then we just have our flat out inspectors that are out there making sure uh, anything that's moving or being placed is being inspected and tested. And then on top of that, because dams are just one of those things that just there's a sensitivity that they can't, like it's one of those things that can't fail. Right. We actually have also gone out and hired a gentleman that actually has experience building dams. And so he goes out there, he's kind of just used as an expert, and he'll go out there and uh, and walk the site. And so it's just one of those things we have multiple things. It's expensive to have all those people out there. But if, if you have any questions about that, Google 1990 flood in Washington County, and you'd understand yeah. why I'm so hypersensitive about it. Yeah, it, it does happen a little bit occasionally. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we had, of course, the, the dam and quail. Yes. Uh, and and uh, fortunately, no lives were lost. Right. But there was some, you know, evacuations and people lost their houses and things. So Yeah, and, and I mean, that was back when the whole area that the flood went through and stuff like that was all farmland and that same land it's full of people now it's full of people and buildings and houses and um it's one of those things that that keeps me up at night and that we spend a lot of time on you cannot you mentioned it it cannot fail you can't screw up on this one it's got to be yeah yeah, it's got to be how big will uh, the chief toker reservoir be when the dam is actually when you actually dam the water off so it'll be a fairly good size. So, so there won't be like ski boats out there, but there'll be kayaks and paddle boats. And so um, smaller than Coal Up Reservoir, um, okay. but a lot bigger than Ivan's is kind of in between those two. And so okay. when it's full, it, it'll be an amazing recreational opportunity for people just to go out there and join and play in it. But then on the agricultural side, it's going to be a really positive thing for the agriculture because the toker system out there is there, it's very limited just because of the hydraulics of where we get the water and limitations. And then now just having that reservoir there sitting there, it'll solve a lot of those hydraulic problems to give people the more flexibility in what they do with watering and, and irrigating the farms out there. What's the next one is, is uh, due to maybe start looking at after Toker? So, of course, we have graveyard and dry wash on the west side of the county. And so we're just kind of working with the agencies on that about which one we go first on. So we, we, would, we really hope to build dry wash first. I mean, excuse me, graveyard first. Graveyard first. Um, 
Did but, we ever come up with a better name? <laughs> yeah, I, I tried. I, I we're, we're working. We're working. Yeah. Um, so graveyard, we hope to build first, um, but because that is on BLM land, there's some things that we have to mitigate there. That may push dry wash first, but we're, we really are trying to push graveyard first. Are there some environmental, the environmental NIPA, whatever? All those, NIPA, it, yeah. it, is there some problems there that we have to worry about? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you'll get me going on this, won't you? <laughs> well, let's, yeah, let's do it. So it went through the <laughs> entire environmental review process. Yeah. And so the BLM's like, yep, it looks good. Go build it. Let's and we're it. like, great, we'll, we'll build it. And so, but we'll only build it when it's necessary. And so they're like, yes, the document says. That was, that was your first mistake right there. Well, the documents say, yeah, <laughs> this will be needed and at the t- appropriate time to build it. Great. And so, we, so we go out, we're like, great, we're ready to build it. We go to the BLM, say we're ready to build it. The BLM's like, okay, there's, you have to mitigate two things. And we're like, okay. And there is some wetlands area down below. And we're like, okay, we can mitigate that. And then a tortoise crawled across. One tortoise. Yeah. Well, they just found tracks. They didn't even find the tortoise. They just they found tracks. Found tracks. And so they're like, well, you have to mitigate the tortoise. It could have been some teenager with fake tortoise tracks. I could have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're like, okay, we'll, we'll go do some things there. But you have that takes process. And so so the BLM's like, okay, we're getting to a good place. But then we have to go get more permits from other federal agencies. So those federal agencies like, well, we've got some more questions. And so it's, it, mm. it costs a lot. I mean, when people complain about, like, why is it so expensive or why am I paying for all this? Part of the process is like when these questions come in, it's not like I can just write a paragraph or an email saying, hey, this is the answer. It's one of those things I have to go hire a geologist and then I have to hire biologists. And it's just not a biologist. It's a tortoise biologist. It's a bird biologist. It's a, <laughs> And they all respond. And so Unbelievable. And then we hire an attorney that specializes in this area of the law to, to take all that information, combine it, and then give it to these federal agencies to work it out. And so... That's amazing to me. They have all these specialists that I read a story today on the news about how the FDA has been rubber stamping uh, some of the containers our food comes in for the last 50 years Mm -hmm. uh, that knowing full well they were uh, bleeding carcinogens into (laughs) our processed foods. uh, And the APA says, well, it's not that much. It's not a big deal. So the government, the FDA Mm -hmm. says, yeah, it's okay if humans get cancer and die, but Boy, if we see a tortoise track, we're going to stop the whole project and make you hire specialists. To yeah. it's it's actually amazing. It so boggles the mind. So just recently, we had a large group of congressional staff from from all parties. So it was uh-huh. equal Republicans, Democrats, and they actually came to Washington County. Some of them was the first time that they were have ever been west of the Mississippi River. Yeah, and so we were talking to them. And we we're like, listen. You have to understand this environmental review process has nothing to do with what's best for the environment. Like I'd much rather take this money because there are some areas that are critical and, and areas that we need to protect. I says, I'd rather take all this money and, and, and work with landowners and, and talk with them and come up with some really creative ideas rather than just spending millions of dollars on paperwork that does nothing. And so, and, the, and just the process is just way out of control did, did so, any of these congressmen congress people did it did a light bulb come on for any of them or i mean it's hard i mean they were very friendly and, and yeah. they were talking about it like to them it was interesting we were sitting up on this this bluff and we were looking out uh, kind of uh, across the arizona strip and and there's just nothing out there like you might say a dirt road and this lady turned to me and i think she was from arkansas anyways she turns to me and she's like well who owns all this land and I says, well, this is all the federal government. You owned. do, yeah, yeah. And she's like, she's like, the federal government owns all this. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, that's it was it was mind boggling for her. Like she couldn't wrap her mind around this vast amount of land that just goes for miles and miles. That's all owned by the federal government. So I brought it up to her and I says, if we want to do anything, if I want to run a power line out there, a water line out there, anything, it it, it takes millions of dollars yeah. and yada yada yada. And so hopefully we kind of help them understand it's just not. I mean, everybody wants to protect the environment, so let's let's do that. Let's not create bureaucrats. So, well said. We'll be right. right back. All the latest news, weather, traffic, and sports, just like you like them. You're waking up with the Andy Griffin Show on News Radio 890, 92.5 KDXU, Southern Utah's News Talk Leader. 
All right, we've come down to the monthly report on the Warner Valley Reservoir, the Warner. <laughs> They've been talking about it for as long as we've had a radio station here in KDXU and, and longer, and uh, I asked Zach about it about once a month, and uh, is it ever going to happen? And Zach's answer is, well, maybe, right, <laughs> usually? Well, uh, we're getting we're one month closer. Yeah. To, um, to, to to what though? So we're in that process of doing a land swap at the BLM, okay. and so the to do that it has to go through this NEPA process that we've been talking about. Yeah, NEPA. And so uh, hopefully, shortly, um, they keep promising me that they'll put out what's called the environmental assessment, where they they put it out and the public will have an opportunity to comment on it. Um, so right now the schedule is that we'll do this land exchange where the BLM will acquire critical habitat and will will acquire the land site. Um, so we'll, we're hopeful that process is completed by next year, and then once we own it, then then it just becomes a matter of a balanced mass equation of we'll build it when it's needed. And so mm-hmm. it's it's a very expensive project. It's two hundred million dollars to build Warner Valley Reservoir. Yeah. yeah. And so at that point, what we'll do is we'll just say, okay, it'll take about five years to construct. And so we'll just kind of do the math and say, as as we grow, if we grow faster, we'll need it sooner. If we grow slower, we'll need it le- lesser out there. But at least at this point of owning the land and having it just ready to go, we can we can jump on it when we need it. Besides the land and the NEPA, is there opposition anywhere else, like maybe from someone downriver to to it? I mean, I'm not going to talk about our lower basin states, California, Arizona, and Nevada. They, if if they had their choice, we wouldn't get any water. We we would give every yeah, that we just send all <laughs> down. But locally, actually, everybody's. Uh, I have not talked to one person that's against Warner Valley. In fact, a lot of the, the private landowners out there are trying to encourage us to build it faster. Uh, the cities want it faster because it will be it'll be like Sand Hollow Reservoir. Like you'll have j- water, ski, you know, boats out there. Pretty big, and, yeah. Um, yeah, so it'll be an amazing, just cool place to go visit and enjoy. And then, uh, of course, it helps us with our water. Now, my son is a dirt biker. He loves to go out in the in the wilderness on the trails. Mm-hmm. Uh, how will this affect? Aren't there dirt bike trails and sure. stuff out there? How will this affect that? So, uh, he also likes going on the lake and the jet yeah. ski too. So, so there's a couple of trails up there that, with this Atlantic exchange, the district will acquire those. Um, like the, I think they call it the West Rim Trail and stuff like that. So those will be, remain open. The, that area won't be flooded. Um, so we will definitely keep it open except for the areas that are flooded. And then some of the camping out there, right now it's just, you know, dispersed camping. Mm-hmm. And so we'll definitely have to go in and do some camping grounds. And we'll have to cut in some new trails and a few things like that to accommodate it. So I will say the ATV community, the dirt bikers, they've actually been really good to work with. They had concerns, valid concerns. We sit down with them. We talked them through what, what you want to do. And, and they were awesome to work with. They really were. And, and we were able to work out some, well, we just kind of explain what we're doing. It really won't affect some, the, the really pristine trails that they want to keep. Did you think 10 years ago you'd be talking about building campgrounds and, and, and meeting with ATV riders and stuff like that? <laughs> 10 years ago? 15 years ago? I'm trying to think where, what I was doing 10 years ago. Uh, 2014. So, so yeah. Uh, you were, were you a, a, a I, county I, commissioner? At, at this point, 10 years ago, I had received the Republican nomination to be a county commissioner. And so, okay. so 10 years ago, I wouldn't have surprised me that I'd be talking about campgrounds and water and stuff like that. Okay. 20 years ago, uh, yeah, that's a different story. 2004. Uh, let's see, I was in, yeah, I'm doing the math yeah. here myself. And we were both a bit younger then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, 9.53 on KDX, we're doing a little reminiscing here. Yeah. Uh, the the water uh, uh, table, you, you mentioned the reservoirs are in pretty good shape mm-hmm. right now, water-wise. Uh, is there any way, I mean... I have a friend who was a climatologist, and his job was to... Climatologists and meteorologists are different. Mm -hmm. Climatologist basically is the guy that looks at everything that's happened in in the last 100 years or whatever, and then predicts the weather based on past trends. Mm -hmm. He could tell you within, you know, a certain percentage, okay, uh, you know, I I look at September 25th for the last 100 years, and this was the weather, uh, and, you know, 92% of the time there was was no rain on September 25th, so I'm going to say there's not 
going to be the rain. Meteorologist, my dad was a meteorologist, and his was actually more kind of a what's the weather doing right now? Where, mm-hmm. What are their clouds? Where's the high pressure, low pressure, all that stuff? And, uh, and, but as far as climatologically, and you got the old farmer's almanac and mm-hmm. some of those, and my dad used to throw that off the stage <laughs> sometimes, he's like, it's worthless. But, uh, d- does it, do you know, do you have any feeling on what we're in store for this winter? No. Oh, this winter, I have no idea. And I, I mean, Noah comes out with their predictions and yeah. all these other things, and it, it, they show me the percentage. And if they're completely wrong, they're like, well, that's why we only said it was a 60%. <laughs> there is 40%. Yeah. And so what we what we design our system for is a dry system. So we're, we're assuming that it's going to be dry this winter. It's going to be dry, you know. Uh, and, and we kind of proceed on kind of a very pessimistic basis on how we're going to supply water to our community. And then if it turns out to be a really good winter, then it's great. Like, we're happy with that. We're glad we got some extra water. And so, we, yeah, we just have to prepare, be prepared for the worst and hope, hope for the best. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Yeah, that's a good way to live life, I guess, sometimes, huh? especially in your position. Yeah, I mean, we just, so. we do it even with our water tanks. We assume it's 115 degrees Everybody's taking a shower, and all of a sudden they have a, a massive fire somewhere. And, yeah. and, uh, and so in preparing that, that's one of the reasons why uh, you have reliable water. Like, I, I lived in an area where we only got water for, well, it just automatically shut off, and you'd never know when it was coming back on. And that's, really? Yeah. Wow. And so we just kind of adapt. I was in Russia, and we just kind of adapted to that way of like, oh, the water might turn off, so we'd actually have like little jugs of water. Just in case. Yeah, and you, it could be like two days. Sometimes it was like three days. Um, we're here. That just, I, I, I've never not had running water through my tap here in Washington County since I've lived here. Sometimes it comes out hot when you have the <laughs> cold on, but that's because that's, that's the way, way we live. Somebody was telling me, uh, I have a friend that lives down in Texas, and he said, yeah, it's that time of year, August is when he was telling me this, that, that the water comes out of the tap warm. And I'm like, yeah, we get that basically from June to, to late August. And uh, I am happy to report I turned on my cold water this morning to wash my face, and it was actually kind of cool. Oh, okay. It was nice. No, well, the temperatures on those lakes are starting to come under. And uh, I actually had somebody complain about it. I got this email. Really? Yeah, that said, hey, I have hot water and my cold water is warm. Yeah. And I want you to fix that. <laughs> and um, we could. Okay. But your water bill would be like quadruple, yeah, well, like put big, big chillers. refrigerators, yeah. <laughs> so, but that's part of living in St. George is is you get, you have hot water and lukewarm water in the summer. And yeah, you just... That's why we have refrigerators. I was going to say, you think back in time, and you were talking about, you know, 100 years ago, the fight over people using too much water and, and, and that kind of thing. Remember, 100 years ago, they didn't have air conditioners either. Yeah, yeah. So water was kind of their only way to cool yeah. down a little bit back then. And, uh, yeah, we, I mean, St. George could not, would not be St. George that we have today without... Uh, air conditioning too, and 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 the, the ability to cool ice. I mean, we take ice for granted. Mm-hmm. I I spent a week and a half in Europe uh, this summer, and they don't like ice in Europe. Mm-hmm. I guess it's kind of a, uh, you know, back in the day before they had freezers, you know, the, they they couldn't get ice unless they were really rich because they had to bring it in from areas, you know, like like the Arctic that actually had ice, and so and that just kind of stuck with the people. They don't put ice in their in the, any of their drinks or anything unless you specifically ask for it. Well. So. It, it, I don't know. We're up on top of uh, the Pine Valley Mountain. There's the ice cave. Yeah, yeah. it's not really a cave, but it's yeah. you can kind of see why it's called a cave. And yeah, they just to send horses up there yeah. to go get ice out of that thing. And and that ice is you nasty. Got, you better hurry back because it's going to yeah. melt, and it's it's also flavored with dirt. Oh, it bugs, so, and yeah. it's kind of nasty. But yeah, <laughs> so we're very. I I'm really glad I live now and not. I like. I like all our modern conveniences. Yeah. And you know what? In 50 years, somebody's going to say, can you believe the, what yeah. they used to endure back in the early 2000s? And, uh, you know, yeah. we, we're glad we're here, though. Yes, we are. Zach Rens from Washington County Water Conservancy District. Go visit the uh, Red Hills uh, Desert Garden up there on Red Hills Parkway. It's absolutely beautiful. It's peaceful. You even have like a fake slot canyon. I don't think I don't know if it's ever flooded, but <laughs> uh, yeah, you even have a fake slot canyon in there and some beautiful vegetation. And uh, Zach, I appreciate the, the good work you're doing, man. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. We're out of time. Be back tomorrow. Bill Hoster is going to join me, and we're going to talk about some happenings with the uh, Hurricane Valley Fire District, as well as his hometown there in Leeds. It's all coming up on the show tomorrow. Thanks for listening.